Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm excited about this one because we've done the other teams. We're doing the best team. And I've brought my favourite content producer for Cow. And I've got Big Ian from the Navy Blue Corner. He is going to be our representative. How are you doing, Ian? Yeah, doing well, Pommy. Thanks for having me on. I know there's so many different uh, Carlton content creators out there, so I'm very flattered that you've chosen me and I'm just so happy and keen to to get stuck in and chat about the Blues. Hey, mate, it, it's good. I'm going to try and be as impartial as I can <laughs> and hide my excitement. I've done really well with the other teams, so I'm going to try and keep it there, but I'll probably break. But, I mean, obviously, 2022, It looking back now, my personal thought is, the disappointments kind of died mm. and I'm kind of looking at it that we created a new benchmark for ourselves. And before the benchmark was 14th, probably now it's mm. ninth. It feels that feels a lot more relatable to a, how do you feel now? We've had a couple of months off and we've had a couple of beers since then. Are you still disappointed? How are you feeling about it? I, I've tried not to think about it too much. It's definitely still a little bit disappointing. Like we, we gave ourselves the best head start to the league. I think it was like eight and two. And, and then to miss out on finals and, and fall it like we did in that second half in those crucial moments, it's really disappointing. But I haven't really been replaying them as much as I was in my head the, after that sort of season ended. It, it's now obviously moved to a bit more positivity. And I think like you say, now that we've shown that we are sort of somewhat good enough to be in that contention, Last year, going into the season, it was all about hope. We were getting excited about beating Melbourne in a preseason game. Like we were talking before we started recording this, like I'm not looking forward to the preseason and needing wins. That's not what it's about. There is still that optimism and excitement, but it's a bit more just, just show me now, boys. No more talk, just do it. And that's kind of the attitude I'm taking into this season. I think the big thing for me as well is that we've had a few fans on here. We've had Geelong, who I think are the specialists of playing the season out. They mm. are the specialists of working out the game management. And we had Caden on from Melbourne, and he was talking about going on 11 and 0. And mm. then when they played us in round 22, 21, I think it was, if we'd won, they would have gone down to 10th. And how yeah. he said that, he used a quote where it really stuck with me. He felt like they burnt a lot of energy just getting the start and setting the benchmark. Mm. And by the end, they'd filtered out. We were very similar, weren't we? Eight yeah. and two, came out of the blocks. I think we were the flag We were the flag favourites at uh, the bye, mentally. And then Insane. the back end, it was real old mm. Carlin, wasn't it? Win one, lose one, win one, lose one, drop two games that we shouldn't have done with Adelaide and Gold Coast. Yeah. Do you think that's something that the group needed to have a bit of maturity to realise that you can't spend all your credits at once and keep something in reserve? Look, probably it's it's that old adage and it's a big thing in, in sort of cycling and like Tour de France and whatnot. It's not about, you know, the first day. It's trying to train and get yourself in that best kind of condition to be there at the end rather than just at the start and that's kind of what it is for us I think last year we just needed to prove something to the competition to ourselves new coach new everything it was that stage where that the group had been through so many coaches I felt like they were almost too hungry at the start of the season to kind of prove it to everyone and that's probably what we saw and then unfortunately it tails away in that back half of the season and it's something we need to get better at even when we were poor. It, it felt like that second half of the year, we'd still struggle and, and we never were really finishing that season hot. And we just need to find a way to do it. There's a whole mentality towards it. And, and I was saying at the end of the year, yeah, the aim was finals. And I think that if we had, we'd made finals, there's really nothing to be negative about going into 2023. You're positive and you're thinking, we're going to just take that natural next step. We're ready to go. Because we didn't, there's still question marks and, and it's that little bit nervy area where everything's a little bit interesting going in because if we, you know, the, if the fix just come out and if we start zero and two, what's the vibe going to be like? But I think we got sort of for the for the coaches anyway, we got all the information we would have got if we did make finals. We, we saw us in those two pressure games against Melbourne and Collingwood and how we reacted the data's there. It's just about what they can do with it because there's clearly, I guess if you say the one downside currently, it's that mentality and being able to take that moment. 
We struggled when it was there. Can we, with the talent we have, seize it and, and play it that big time? Uh, that's the big question going into next year. I think the other big question as well is the injuries, isn't it? Yes. It's something that's come up with all the other clubs as well. Some, like Geelong, have none. Some, yeah. like you know Melbourne, they had their, their fair share at wrong times. Eagles, mm. obviously decimated by injuries like Carlton. Is that something that you're looking in this year as a one-off? Which, speaking to some of the other clubs, that's kind of where they were. They were like, okay, cool. It happens. That's mm. our time. Um, speaking to the Geelong guy, he was like, we've had our fair share of hist- historical injuries. We mm. were due an injury-free season. Do you think injuries was a big part of Cowton's slide down the ladder? Or do you think that that's nothing to do with it? It definitely played a role. I never liked blaming injuries for everything. And I think that what highlights that mentality the most is looking at those last two games with the injuries that we had, having to play Doherty in the midfield, throwing Setterfield back in there where he was primarily on the wing for most of the season and having to try different players out in weird spots. We were still put ourselves in winnable positions against two teams that played finals. So really... Yeah, there's, it definitely hurt us. We didn't have our best 22-23 on the park for bulk of that year, but we still got ourselves in that position to win games and play finals. So I, as far as it is an issue, and when you look at the guys that keep getting injured and, and probably the, how they're getting injured, there seems to be quite a few load injuries, and we're talking about second half of the season struggling. There's obviously some sort of overall fitness issue, but... I know Carlton, this is the this is the hot topic in the offseason, particularly on Carlton Twitter, everyone talking about this. It's it's insane to just blame one person. And I think that's what I've tried to read into a bit of what Voss is saying. Like, yeah, maybe there's some issues with Andrew Russell, but there's obviously some issues with the players as well. You hear Voss say it's about making every single recovery, not missing that ice bath. And for a lot of the players that were injured last season, it felt like there was a lot of recurring Out of that, it it was your McGovern's. It was unlucky to some extent, but Marchbank, Williams, Martin, you can throw Cunningham into that. Guys that seemingly are always injured. So how much of that can you really say is, is it an injury issue? Is it it a player issue? Are we we carrying too many guys that just have historically never made it through a season? And I think if we are able to get a fit team firing, it should be good. We need these players like, you know, your Cheras and Walsh's, Hewitt's to make sure that they're not missing at that important time at the end of the year. But we need to get the most out of those other guys that seemingly are always injured. I agree. And I think a big thing for me is my thoughts on this year is, unlike years gone by, like I always look at 2018, the worst year to be a fan. My end of the season thoughts was, shit, we need a new team. We need Mm. a new coach. We need probably a new stadium because maybe icons cursed. Like (laughs) it was literally, I was throwing blanket accusations at the club where now it feels like you can go back and we missed out on the finals by percentage. You Mm. can actually categorize where it went wrong. You can identify Durden running into 50 twice against Collingwood and yeah. invariably just missing the target and turning over. You can identify Charlie just being yeah. too casual in that set shot, Harry doing it. You can look at the missed tackle. There's like literal things you can go say. Mad like, if you do it as well. <laughs> yeah. And it's the same with the injuries. You can, and I think the club addressed that. I thought Nick Austin saying, we're looking for durability. Mm. And I thought yeah. that was him saying, the recruitment at times has taken chances on fitness. We're not going to anymore. We're bringing in three or four guys who have a clean bill of historical injury health. And I think that that's maybe what we're starting to see now that mm. the club has taken a few risks on players. Um, we, we, the few of them on that list were <laughs> injured in their draft year, looking at yeah. Kent there as well. I think mm. that's a new structured plan from Cal. Do you get that vibe now that there seems to be a method to the madness as opposed to just throwing darts. But first, an ad. Sponsors of today's channel are Manscaped, the best in men's below the waist grooming. Their products are precision engineered to look after the most important jewels in your house, your family jewels. Manscaped's performance package is an absolute game changer and it's the ultimate in men's hygiene. 
Join over 7 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped. And I've got an exclusive offer for you. 20% off free worldwide shipping if you use the code POMI at manscaped.com at the checkout. And if my maths is correct, that's around 14 million balls that they service. Time to throw out your razor. Performance Package 4.0 is, like I say, a game changer. You want to take your on-ball game to the next level, Manscaped will help you out. And I've got to say, the boxers that with their anti-chafing technology are the comfiest things I have put my pert little behind on. Click the link, get 20% off and free shipping with code POMMY, that's P-O-M-M-Y at manscaped.com. 20% off, free shipping anywhere in the world. Unlock your confidence and use the right tools from the job and take your on-ball game to the next level. Back to you in the studio. I think if now it, like that's really when you look at the draft in the off season, it was clear that we're after. Uh, firstly, you don't get injured. Firstly, and then it was just like we want run, we want endurance, and that was in speed. And if you look at the team and what we're probably missing, it was we struggled a little bit really with transition. Like if you look at earlier in the season, how many times did we get the ball in that defensive half, and it was just long kick down the line, intercepted. And we'd be back under pressure again. It was like we had no method moving the ball. If it was a if it was a, a stoppage or a clearance, we had our big midfield balls that could get it out, and we were great there in the inside part of the game. But it was on the outside that we struggled with, and so it really probably one of the first times I've seen the off season, and it looked like we had a clear plan. We went to it. It wasn't just you know best available. We went for what we looked for, and bringing in you know Holland's bins, Acres as well. Like this, and Lachlan Cowan as well it was clear what we were looking for, and so it's going to be interesting to see that next step because we've only had one season with Vossi, and we didn't have this outside speed. We didn't have any good wingers really. I'm excited to see what actually happens now that we've we're building towards a bit more of a plan because it's another aspect of the first season of a coach. Vossi came in didn't really get to pick a lot of his own players in the trade or, or draft period. It was kind of just what was there. Now you've got a season of him looking at the list, putting in his game plan. Clearly there were some deficiencies that he's like, I need this to be able to win premierships. So let's see how it goes one year in. Well, I mean, moving into the trade period, and I totally agree with you, like just with the structure, you also saw Cout and jettison quite a few players. And there's a couple there that, I think was a changing of a guard. Noonsy being one, mm. uh, Oscar McDonald and Stocker, controversially for a lot of Cowton fans. But all three of them are players that I would associate years gone by, Cowton would have kept yeah. and in the hopes. So like Stocker hopes he becomes an A-grade midfielder or hopes he breaks into the halfback line. And I enjoyed the fact that Cowton mm. got rid of these players with... No real mercy. It was very quick. Mm. It was bang, bang, bang. We need to free up the space. And the same with Setterfield. I like the fact that Cowton got rid of him, a guy that probably isn't going to win as a flag. At best, yeah. he's a squad player. And it's the fact we didn't stand in his way. And we brought Blake mm. Akers in for next to nothing. Was yeah. that the trade period you were expecting? Were you expecting Cowton to be very quiet? Or did you think Cowton might be a bit bold and adventurous? Leading up to it, everything you were hearing in the media sounded like it was going to be pretty quiet for us, which is not the Carlton thing. I'm used to the season being the trade period because that's the only time we get a dub, really. But it was interesting to sit back and have really the one move as far as incomings in Blake Acres. We wrap it up early, and that's us really done. I think the most positive thing, and, and even throughout the, the whole rebuild and the poor years, the best thing is... To this date, we haven't really lost a player that we wanted to keep. Like you could maybe say SPS if you really wanted to argue, but like again, like what's he really done at West Coast? It's not the worst one to lose. And this time we, we decided to give up, you know, a set of field and we we got rid of Stocker. Where we're not losing those big marquee players and looking at the trade period, can't imagine what it's like for, you know, a Western Bulldogs that are losing a Dunkley, someone who's one of their better players. I don't know that feeling so far as a Carlton supporter. We've managed to sort of hold on to this group so far, which is really nice to see that buy-in. And then, yeah, I, I was hoping maybe there was going to be 
someone that would come out and a superstar of the game to come to Carlton. But I'm pretty happy. Like, I think we're all, as Carlton supporters, pretty comfortable with the list we have. It's just about those little pieces. And as I said, wing was clearly an issue. Getting that width and being able to burst away. We, we don't have a lot of those players that can sort of two-way run and really do it well at the midway of the season, Blake Akers was in the all Australian conversation and that's not my nuffy hat on. That's what other people were saying when he was playing for someone that's not Carlton. So to bring in that, to bring in Ollie Hollands as well, who looks like he's ready to go round one, it's going to be an exciting time. I, th- I think anyway, I've got my positivity on. No, mate, that's, that's why you're here. You are always find a positive, which I appreciate as a guy that has a roller coaster. Uh, mentally in this count and thing. But I agree. And I thought Blake Akers, uh, it said to me that trade period that they're content with the list. Mm. It said that there was no reason to panic. And the fact they cut so many players who many people had in the best 22. And I actually look at the injuries as maybe a blessing. You've got to remember this Mm. time last year, Oscar McDonald was the starting fullback for Carlton. And because of his injury, Lewis Hay. Lewis Young rose mm. and we, we we looked pretty good with Lewis Young and other injuries. Noons, when he started to get injured, Carlton started to rotate. Boyd came through and we saw mm. Boyd was actually worth it. So that kind of excites me that Carlton backed the list as opposed to maybe panicking, which I think mm. maybe we would have done years gone by. Had that bad end of the year and gone, oh shit, we need to bring in another superstar yeah. or so it felt like Voss and Austin and the list management were like, nah, if we can just get a bit of layers, get a two-way runner, add to that, we'll be fine. And it's the list. And that excites me. And moving into the draft, obviously, you do some wonderful work. You cover it extensively, like myself. Were you thinking there was a lot of rumors, weren't they, that Carlton were going to get to first and trade mm. up? In the end, they didn't, and they didn't give much, but they really did move up the board to get some players. Were you happy with the acquisitions, and were they guys that you were hoping we'd get? Definitely early. Like, Ollie Hollands was the one I was earmarking just for all his traits, and he is someone that I think, like we're talking about him being this winger, and I think there's a possibility that he does move into the, the midfield in a couple of years. He's obviously such a skinny kid so far, but once he puts on some size... With his traits, I don't think he's just that outside player. He can move in there, hopefully, in a few years. But, yeah, it was really exciting. I wasn't maybe expecting us at that stage of the draft. I think when Hawthorne took Sydney's pick early, I thought, well, that's us done. I don't think we're going to maybe trade back in here. I'm just not too sure who wants to trade out. So I was surprised to see us get back in there and particularly get a trade done with Collingwood, which I would never have been able to imagine in my whole life that – they would have accepted something that seemed so fair because if it was coming the other way, there's no chance I would have done that deal with Collingwood. I would have said, no, give us seven first rounders or get stuff. So I love to see that happening. And yeah, I wasn't expecting Lockie Cowan there. He was one of my favorites of that draft class. I think just positional need, it seemed as if Carlton had quite a few players of that kind of smaller halfback defensive, defensive player. But I liked that we just clearly have a role earmarked. And as I said, we struggled with a bit of transition. He's someone that can use the ball, kick it long and and help our transitional play. He always, when he gets the ball, wants to attack, take the game on. I think we need that. Plus his leadership ability is another thing. We're talking about mentality and some players may be struggling in the heat of the battle. He's someone that wants to take it on. He's someone that says, no, give me the ball. I want to make this moment happen. And those players can sometimes be rare to have. So I think quality-wise, that's what you're looking for. And it's not still sewn up. Like we've talked a bit about, you know, Zach Williams, to an extent, is an injury-prone player. You've got Nick Newman, who I think he's only 29 or something like that. He's not super old, but you want to start being better than these players on the list. And if he can add something into that defense... And then you've got a winner. I'm always happy to take quality. And then, you know, going with, with bins with the next pick, another one of those wide players. I was maybe expecting us to get an Ollie Hutton because I think a role that we still maybe need is that forward transitional player, that high half forward or someone that can kind of have that eye for goal. I think if you're looking, we've got the two common medalists that are, that are kicking snags for fun, but it's those smalls 
that maybe need to contribute a little bit more. So I was surprised that we maybe didn't go there, particularly after he was available at that bins pick. But I, I touched this on, on, on the podcast talking about maybe why he slid. And if you're looking into the draft, and this is where I really want to get more focus on to in, in future years and learning about that talent evaluation is those players that maybe didn't dominate a position in the under 18s. He wasn't a dominant midfielder, wasn't a dominant forward. He was sort of in between. And does that translate or is he just going to get, you know, everyone run above him in the pecking order because he didn't nail a spot. But I think that's probably the only question mark, maybe apart from Ruck at this stage from our off season dealings is do we still have those, smaller players that can get that ball in that forward line and make something happen. That's probably the big question mark still, but I was still very happy with, with what we're able to bring in. It was very surprised, wasn't it? And I remember doing the interview with Ollie Hollands and Hotton as well mentioned him. Mm. That when we talked, to, I asked them the question, who was the most underrated in the draft? Who you shocked? All of them said Bins. I think Bins, yeah. Bins and Phoenix Foster were the two most popular choices that were like, how are these people not being talked about? And mm. I remember Holland saying that Binzi is like the most consistent player. Like he's, he doesn't have shit games. His shit games is very good. And mm. that, that excited me when he talked about Binzi. Cause I was thinking that, that when I look at Cowan's list, and I don't know how you feel is I don't think we have, we have way too many players that can give you a 10 out of 10 and win you the game. But, them players also can give you a one out of 10 yeah. and cost you the game. Where when I look at Geelong, they have a lot of players that their best is probably seven out of 10, but their worst is six, right? Mm. And I I like having at least eight of them players in the 22 because that allows your Jack Martin to have that game where he has one touch, no yeah. tackles. But then the next week have six goals from five touches and you're like, that doesn't even make sense. So... <laughs> Did, did 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 you do you feel that Cowton have really focused that as well with both all three mm. of their signings uh, exceptionally consistent as well they're they're boringly consistent. <laughs> no, I think it is important because if you if you're trying to analyze this list, like the top end talent is there. We had what three All Australians, five in the squad, Coleman medalist there, Weedering who should be an All Australian. Like we, we've got. Doherty's in there is all Australian as well. Like we've got the top end. It's now about those role players. And I think that's what the trade period was when you look at getting in a player like Blake Akers. He's not going to be that absolute superstar. No one's expecting him to, but he plays his role week in, week out. And that's what wins you flags. Like, yes, it is the top players that take those moments. But like you say, it's the consistency. It's those other players. And they're the ones that get spoken about because there's going to be a moment in a big game where you need someone to, to, to lay a bump, to, to do the hard work that is not going to be up in lights. And those are the guys that do that. And I think as well with, with like a Jackson bins, it's an interesting component where if you just baseline sort of analyze it, you go, Oh, cool. They bought some speed and some outside run. But what I think bins is compared to everyone else that we picked up and what we don't have on the list is particularly for a wide player, someone that can win the football is an accumulator. We've got like 29 touches um, in one of those games and if you're looking at what we have with maybe a Cottrell or a O'Brien, they don't win a lot of the football. So I think to have an attacking guy that seems to be that ball magnet that, again, is that attacking player, that's exciting for me. It's not just adding another layer of something we have. It's trying to better it. And that probably goes back to like the Jack Nunes kind of talk of someone that he was pretty consistent, but he didn't have that ceiling. It's about trying to replace that with better. And I think hopefully, fingers crossed, that's something we've done. No, I agree with you. And I think the other one we haven't touched on yet is Harry Lemmy. And it was, mm. I, I've just recorded a video where we went back to this time last year and we looked at the draft rankings and the draft ratings. And I've gone through all the pundits, my own mm. rankings. And his core average position was eighth, Harry yeah. Lemmy, at this time. And it, it's something I always say there's a lot of talk about the Camparelli brothers, the twins. And I'm always like, a lot happens in yeah. 24 months. 12 months is catastrophic. Mm. And Harry Lemmy, I think he's a really interesting proposition for two reasons. One, he's done a Calton before he's got to Calton. He was a key forward, then became a backman, bit of rock, back to the back, then finished <laughs> the year as a forward. So he's already done that. Yeah. I'm changing my role. But when you look at his story, um, Tom Scully was a favorite of mine. Mm. Lemmy 
literally nominated himself to go back because he wanted to get in the team. Mm. And he knew it was so tough with all the forwards they had. I think this kid here is probably the steal of the draft, in my opinion, because he, him and Scully were both two guys that did a lot and had high mm. numbers, kind of were forgotten about, though, because of the famous Barnets and players like that mm. playing their role. Is he someone that really excites you? Because he's probably, in my opinion, got the easiest job in world football. He's going to learn off two All-Australian mm. Coleman medalist forwards and two top elite key defenders. So wherever he plays... He's got pretty good brothers to learn off. Yeah, it's it's such a tough one when you're talking about guys that are going so late in the draft because it so could easily go either way. I'll obviously always be super positive. And like you said, like this was someone that even mid-year in a lot of people's rankings was still in the top 10, still in the top 20 because of what he had done last season. So there is clearly a player there. And I was big on either him or Scully being taken at one of these later picks. I thought... We're struggling a little bit with that key forward depth. And yeah, we could probably take another key defender if you wanted, maybe a swing man, someone that can play all those roles. So it made sense to go after him. And and with, with Lemmy being able to, I think the difference between him and Scully, Scully has all the athleticism and that those raw attributes. Whereas Lemmy, he's got that to a degree, but he's got that footy IQ. Like his leading patterns are there. There is clearly a player. It's just about unlocking that. And as far as, yeah, his circumstance, no one's at the late pick he went with the players Carlton have, no one's expecting this guy to play, if ever. Honestly, there's no expectation on him. And he has the ability to learn. And, and I think that hearing things from, you know, Harry Mackay on the Dylan, Dylan Friends show where he talked about doing the extra yards, uh, there has been question marks on Lemmy and his competitiveness coming into this culture that it's seen as you have to do the things outside the club with a guy like Mackay who's doing that as well, taking him under his wing, it, it could be the perfect scenario to get the best out of him. And, and like I said, I, I'm positive and, and hoping that he can become that player because that's just going to be better for us. But look, even if he doesn't, it's, it's a dart throw and it doesn't matter because it's such a late pick. You don't give up anything. But I think the upside is definitely there. And it's, it's not just Nuffy saying, oh, this guy's going to be a superstar. Like, we have seen some of it. It's just a matter of harnessing that. And I think that hopefully we can see that in the years to come. I, I think this draft is so important for Carlton in the terms of if we're going to be a good side, no longer do we get the cheat code of a top five pick, where in my mm. opinion, I know Carlton have fucked it up a few times, but if you fuck up a top 10 pick in 2022 onwards now, mm. you're an idiot. Like, honestly, yeah. you, you should be banned as list management because it is the chances are high. Now, Carlton are going to have to master what Richmond, what Geelong have absolutely nailed for nearly 10 years. And that is mm. taking these guys in your 25s, 30s, 40s and cultivating them to be a lot mm. better than they are. And Lemmy, for me, and Bins are the two guys that Carlton are going to have to learn from Geelong. Geelong often takes sliders, guys that were probably a bit higher ranked and got lucky, and they back their culture, mm. they back their system in to make the AFL eat their words. And that is what I'm looking for in five years' time. I'm looking for Lemmy to be a 40 mm. goals a year player, Binzi to be that top echelon player where we're going to have to do it because if we're going to get yeah. good, we're always going to have that pick in the mid-30s that mm. pick early 40s, they are always going to be our bread and butter picks. Yeah, and with us giving away, you know, some future picks like second and a third round, I think this was the year that it, it's not like a, I'm going to, it's going to sound silly, but like it's not a mini rebuild, but we needed that one more dip higher in the draft pool to sort of keep us going for the next couple of years, considering we had traded away so many first round picks for talent. We needed that one last go. And, and I'm pretty happy with our, our business because, like if you're looking at the list profile, as much as maybe this is a bit negative, but like we're looking to build and win a premiership in the next couple of years. That's where we're aiming for. But it wouldn't surprise me if we was, were just a finals team for the next few years. Unfortunately, Cripper misses his maybe prime. But then because of what we've built underneath, we've got the Walsh, we've got Weedering, all these guys that little bit younger. If he's then that you know 30 plus year old leader that takes us 
through that next generation. And so I think even if we aren't able to strike over these next few years, like we're anticipating, it is you do continually need to keep building. It's what the good teams do. Like you mentioned, a Geelong, like a Sydney, you're always ticking over with that young talent coming through. And so I think we're finally structured well because in years gone by the draft, it was just, who are we going to get? The amount of, I remember going through and doing a whole video with Lockie on the Navy Blue Corner where we went through the drafts from like 2009 onwards and it was disgusting seeing some of the names that came through that never played a game, never went to another football club, but just unfortunately just picked poorly. So I feel like we're finally seeing signs of a professional football club. Now that all of this is happening, surely it has to reflect on field for once. And I think that's what we're all banking on now. There does feel like there's a sense, doesn't they, of a plan? It does. It does. Mm. It, it does feel like we're not a laughing stock of the AFL. Yeah. It feels like you, you can actually see what they're doing. And I want to ask your opinion of this. I tried to do the best twenty-two the other day, being heavily asked, "Can you do a best yeah. twenty-two video?" And honestly, I I I always do videos, and I have one mind of I play a game with myself called negativity bingo, and I try and predict what people are going to complain about in that video. Mm. I could see about a thousand complaints yeah. as I was doing it. Cause I was like, Jesus, this is hard. Do you go McGovern mm. March bank or do you oh. go March bank Cowan or Boyd? H- how is this going to work? Like, do you actually feel mm. now that there's probably 30 players fighting for 22 spots all of a sudden? It's insane. You bring that up. Cause I was going over a best 22, I think last weekend trying to figure it out. And it seems like every year it gets harder and harder, which is such a positive thing. And it's no longer looking at it going, is it this dud or this dud? It's actually some good some good players are going to miss out. And I think that's what it probably excites me most going into this year is seeing what the coaches and the selection panel are actually picking. Because even as, as simple as going down to the rucks, which I think is maybe one of those still areas for improvement. We saw Pitt and Ed at the start of the year when our midfield seemingly worked the best was dominating in there and helping us with those center clearances. But then, you know, is he going to be that guy that takes that step or are you going to see deconing is as the one stepping up? I know everyone's talking about him. He's out of contract. That normally means that he has a big season. You never know if you're going to hold on to him or not, but he needs to show quite a lot this year. Can you play both of them? Is it one going to be taking that spot? You mentioned the defense. What's the shape going to look like there? The last end of the at the last few games we saw us play with really the four tools all down there. Is it just going to be one of one of them with the intercept? I don't know. Does Marchbank take over Lewis Young and then it's McGovern, Marchbank, Weedering? Like they're all really fascinating options going into the season. There's going to be a lot of guys that that miss out. And then there's younger guys that you never know who's going to take that step. Does a camp finally become that swing man? Does he become the intercept defender? Is he that third kind of forward? Or, or even a Jack Carroll that there's always a bit of hype going into the season the last few years around him. Like what's his best position? Does he find a way to break into this team? Even talk about the, the mystery man, David Cunningham. What's going on with him? Does he exist? We all, he's like, I don't even know what the analogy is, but he's the one person that, that every single Carlton fan, if you ask them, like, who's the smoky? Who could be, who could unlock everything? For whatever reason, we've all pinned it on David Cunningham, probably because we've never seen him in about six years. But I'm excited if we can see a glimpse of him. Is he going to be someone that breaks in and is that half forward connector? Like they're, they're all good questions. And unfortunately, there could be guys like, and O'Brien that had a really decent year last year that just, you know, we're near best 22 because players have jumped you and that's the best scenario possible. Mate, mate, I agree. And speaking to the guy at uh, Richmond, he he had a really good thing and it's something that's annoyed me about the Tigers for years. When they have an injury, some dude comes in mm. and you're like, how is he better than the guy he's replaced? <laughs> yeah. And I, I see that. Last year, we saw Voss start mm. to drop players for performance. But O'Brien was dropped mid-year, came straight back in. And I always say, I think he needed another game. I, I, I don't yeah. like the in in out. I think you need two or three games for your lesson. Now I actually see, if a player's dropped, I'd be shitting myself at Carlton because yeah. I think there's eight blokes, and you just mentioned some of them there, who are going to take your job and mm. potentially retire you. And there's a few players there that... 
I, I want to be in that situation round six. Some guy's got a niggle and mm. we're suddenly going, oh, how's he getting back in the side? Like, And that's where we want. And I don't mm. think we've had that probably since we last played finals. Yeah, last year was honestly the first time, and I know Vossi was big on next man up, and that was the the rhetoric that kept coming out. But it was the first time that, and I'll highlight one player in particular, and it was Jordan Boyd, who you have some hopes for, but you just you, the way he came into the club, you're just kind of expecting. It's on the list for a few years, plays a handful of games, and you move him on. But he came in, and it was almost okay. Well, is any is someone going to come be able to come back in? Like, can Zach Williams? replace Boyd because Boyd's been playing well and it was a weird conundrum to have and it's something that I agree we may have a few players that we don't expect to be best 22 but on performance you just can't drop them and again com- competition for spots is what we need we need to really be driving these guys and and maybe that's the recipe that we're after where we've been talking about a Jack Martin Zach Williams Mitch McGovern for years like these guys need to step up and I think this is going to be that year that either they step up because there's competition and take it or someone else does. And that's fine by me. I no longer am super attached to players. Like I don't care who's in that team as long as we win games. And I like that that seems to be the mentality almost inside the club. Now we're not holding these players up as messiahs. It's no, no, no. You need to perform or you're out. And we saw that with Silvani who got dropped too much um, negativity from all the Carlton supporters, but I kind of like the ruthlessness there where if for whatever reason they don't think that he fits or they're not happy with something, which again, we don't know why he was necessarily dropped. There might've been something he wasn't doing on the field. I like that. We're not just saying no stay in because the fans like you. It's no, we're bringing someone else in. Oh, and I think it makes you better players, doesn't it? And I, mm. I think the only success story we've had in the last five years is someone like Matty Cottrell who, <laughs> I remember we drafted him and a lot of people yeah. were like, who's this guy? Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. He, he's rubbish. And he was a guy that came in, took his opportunity. And, you know, last year it was kind of like he was your first choice winger. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? He was the first name. And now he's under pressure where years gone by, Cottrell would be able to dine out on 2021 for the next decade. Yeah. And get a contract every year because everyone would be like, remember 2022? How good was that year? Mm. And you're like, it's 2031. Like, it's 10 years ago. Now, he has got to back up his development last year. Same as Mm. O'Brien. They have to say, that was last year. I'm adding another 10% this year. Otherwise, Hollands, Bins, they're going to kick these guys out. Yeah, I think there's there's a lot of players that this year, whether they're out of contract or not, like it's it's almost make or break for them. And it's some experienced players, it's some younger guys, because like you mentioned, anything could happen. Anyone could take a spot at any stage and you just have to be performing at 100%, which is probably the first time that pressure I think has been there. And and that's, that's the real exciting part for Carlton supporters, which is why we're so up and about. We've seen the average players on our list seemingly perform. It's just taken that last, that last step really. And with like continually with whatever Nick Austin's done, it seems like whoever he brings in is better than the last group. So I, I'm just, I, I can't wait to see what happens with this group. There, there's so much positivity around it and look, it could all, we could miss finals and it could all be hell. That's just the nature of football. But you just got to think with the, with the players we have, we, we've, we've surely got to be in this eight and the, the draw comes out, the fixture comes out, you start to get a bit excited with some of the, the runs you have there. We've just got to get the best out of everyone. Mentality has to be there. And hopefully they've learned some lessons because there was so many moments that we, we failed. And if they don't learn from it, then we've got some big problems, but I, I hopefully that's not the case. You know what? It's one of them things, isn't it, that next year is a real anticipation year. But Mm. for a lot of different reasons, it's not will we be good. It feels like the question is Mm. how good Mm. are we going to be? And that is probably a culture shock for us. It's a culture shock for the players. I remember saying (laughs) at the bye, the players must be so confused going into the bye that it's not two and eight. And they open the Herald Sun and say... Cripps isn't a proper captain. Voss is a bad coach. They're reading praise and going, mm. oh, we've never been here before. Like, yeah. I've never heard Kane Conn say we're good. Like, 
And how are you going into 2023? Now, the, there's an area of expectation. What are your thoughts mm. of the successful 2023 for these boys? Yeah, well, I, I like to touch on like a, a Cripper quote, to be honest. I, I think it was him that said it. Uh, he was mentioning like they went into the season with hope and now they've got belief. And that seems to be how it feels across the, the board, really. Like last season, it was look, I'd like to make finals, but, and we, and we need to make finals, but you were almost just, uh, you wanted to see if the players were any good. There were so many, like a crop, of, a crop of players that I like to call question mark players. And that was like your Zach Fishers and those ilk where are they good or are we just thinking they're good because they play for us and they were a high draft pick. Whereas we finally saw the signs that they were good AFL players. And I think this year, it, the pass mark is finals. But that's not what we're aiming for. I, I think you have to take that that next step, even though we didn't make finals last year. The, the aim's top four. The aim's to win a couple of finals and and get to that prelim. That's just where you have to be aiming, because I think if you if you're that football club that doesn't make finals one year and says that finals is fine, there's a whole other bunch of clubs that are aiming higher for you and, and are going to over overtake you. There's a bunch that I think are going to be playing better than they did last year that missed out on finals. So we've just got to take that next next step. And, and it feels like everything's building correctly. I'm definitely not in the hopeful camp. It feels like there's that belief that, yeah, we're just going to do it now, but not in a complacent way. You know, I've seen enough. I know the hard work's coming. May I feel the same. I feel like nice and relaxed and, I feel like the talk at the club has always been gaining respect of the yeah. AFL, which I think we've lost. And I think one thing that turns me on already is hearing opposition fans, pundits, actually talk about Carlton mm. as a legitimate threat. Not uh, yeah. Even they've stopped saying, oh, will Carlton be there? They've mm. now said Carlton will be there. Like, what level are they going to be there? Though? Are they going to be in the eight, in the four, yeah. threatening top? And I think that's something that's exciting now. It's an adjustment, not just for the players, but also us, that it's weird in December, you're not defending the team. Yeah. You're kind of like agreeing with some of the media and going, yeah, that's fair. We're probably an eight. Mm. So it's an exciting time. But Ian, where do we find you? The links are below me. Where do we find you though? Because no one ever reads. That's a fact. <laughs> Yeah, look, it is the the Navy Blue Corner is the name of the podcast. We're on all your streaming services. We're on YouTube. Socials is at Navy Blue Corner. Nice and easy. If you head over to the socials, you'll find links galore. Like, subscribe, follow, all that stuff. But honestly, give it a listen. That's all that matters. Whether you, whether you go to the extra steps, doesn't matter. At Navy Blue Corner, there's all the lovely plugs for you. If you, if you like the opinions, go for it. It's me and my mate, Lockie. We've been baggers fans for years. I've got my... Uh, 23 little patch here so for a 26 year old i feel like that's kind of uh, it means a lot to me uh need to iron that on need to actually get some chores done to make that happen but yeah if you, if you like your carlton chat we try to cover it all we try to be bring that air of positivity i don't think it's too nuffy where we're just positive for the sake of being positive but in those hard moments we try to find the light is how i'll uh, how i'll try to i guess summarize the uh the pod but yes navy blue corner is where you'll find it Got to say, I can validate that. You are my go-to pod. So, I mean, you are. I, I am your number one fan. I listen to all your stuff. <laughs> and honestly, it's not nuffy. It's not nuffy based. It's it's pretty good. It's They find a positive. Sometimes mm. the positive makes you laugh. Sometimes it makes you think, but it's always good. But Ian, mate, I wish you the best for 2023. I'm sure we'll be doing a lot of content together anyway because we are both the same side so that makes it easier but everyone go and check ian and Lockie out they're fantastic pair good value and uh go blues i suppose yeah look thanks for having me pommy um it's been an absolute blast and yeah up the baggers up the baggers cheers mate